Hello guys, I hope that you all are doing fine. And today we need to start with this topic here, which is the neurological condition. So we will start from this stroke. If in dental practice, if this event occur, which is the stroke, you need to do the first aid management that we will read in the uh, like following topic. Patients who have had the stroke may be taking anti-thrombotic drugs okay so patient who had a history of stroke in the past then they might be taking the anti-thrombotic drugs so you need to schedule and manage your patient according to the like the topic that we read before if the patients are taking anticoagulant or antiplatelet triple anticoagulant therapy dual antiplatelet therapy or whatever it is so you need to manage it accordingly patients who have had have had a stroke may have a physical impairment that affects their ability to carry out usual oral hygiene practices so it is difficult for them because they may have some physical impairments to do the oral hygiene practices which is brushing and flossing Patients with the residual neurological deficit of the arm, they can have difficulty cleaning their teeth. So what um, uh, modifications you can do is you can ask them to use large handled or powered toothbrush can improve the effectiveness of oral hygiene. So advise those patients to use the electric toothbrush. Then patients with seventh cranial facial nerve weakness, they do accumulate food debris on the affected side because they cannot really move that side. So there is a lot of food debris that can uh, deposit on that area and that can, that can cause difficulty with the denture fitting as well. Okay, so you need to modify the denture design, include a thickened flange and consider an implant bone prosthesis. The patient must be sufficiently healthy to undergo the surgical procedure and be able to maintain good oral hygiene. So you can only consider these implant bone prosthesis means implant like all on four or other procedure where you can put the implants there and uh, the prosthesis. Uh, and uh, but for for that uh, treatment, you need to first make sure that patient is healthy, okay, and he is able to maintain good oral hygiene. Although implants are immune to decays, but they are very sensitive to gum issues. So it is very very important that patient would uh, be very motivated to follow the good oral hygiene habits. Then epileptic, if epilepsy attack happened in your clinic then you we will manage it and for patients with epilepsy you need to assess the stability of their condition including you need to ask uh, in their medical history that how frequently do the seizures occur and what triggered them at each appointment check that the patient has taken their usual medication because because omission of doses can cause seizure. So what you need to check with their medical history, you need to ask them about the frequency of the attack and is there any triggers in the dental operatory that we need to be make sure or they have taken the medication today or not. Also avoid stressful extended procedure. Consider the use of a mouth prop to prevent the patient from biting the operator's finger or instrument if a generalized seizure occur during treatment. Okay, so you can also take help from the mouth prop that would help the operator's finger, that would help uh, to prevent the patient biting the patient, operator's finger. Then there are some epileptic, anti-epileptic drugs which are phenytoin, sodium valparate, carbamazepine and barbiturates. They can cause gingival enlargement. 
which is the gingival hyperplasia. So it is the overgrowth of the gingiva on the teeth and it would lead to false pocket. So, okay, so this is also, you can read in detail about this, like try to find any article or you can try to read it online. What is the gingival enlargement caused by the anti-epileptic drug? So you, you will need it. Um, you will know in more detail because there is one scenario as well where they would just show you the picture and they would give you the history that the patient is taking antileptic drug like mainly the phenytoin and sometimes sodium valparate and what could be the reason of this inflammation so they would give you free options so you should know that these drugs can also cause the gingival enlargement so it can how you can ma um, manage this in enlargement is by good oral hygiene and if there is any extensive gingival enlargement then you may need to refer to uh, the patient to the specialist because they may need to do certain small surgeries to remove that okay then trisaminal neuralgia patients with trisaminal neuralgia may mistake their symptoms for toothache there is a chapter in um, uh, Ordell it's like a headache like it is towards the end and um, you can read that chapter so uh, that case so that case would give you general idea of all the neurological based pains like migraine cluster headache trisaminal neuralgia or any other like sinister headaches and uh, uh, you will know more about them because there is one scenario on this topic as well in the exam. Dental pain, particularly pulpitis, is qualitatively similar to trisaminal neuralgia. So, careful evaluation of the teeth is required. If the findings from an oral examination and test, that is the pulp test and the x-ray, do not suggest a dental pathology, if you have done all the, like patient has come to you with the pain, okay, so you have done all the tests, you have done even the x-rays and still you cannot find anything related to the tooth related cause. The, or if initial dental treatment does not reduce the pain, you can consider the possibility of trisaminal neuralgia. But do not undertake further dental treatment or perform invasive or irreversible pulpitis, sorry, irreversible procedures unless a dental pathology is confirmed. So this is very important line which they have given like so many times. Whenever you are not, your diagnosis is not confirmed, you should not uh, proceed with any invasive or irreversible treatments which are mainly the root canal treatment or the uh, extraction. Okay, so you need to be very, very sure about that. And if facial pain is not dental in origin, refer the patients for medical assessment. So if you have tried to do all the tests, everything you uh, you try to do, okay, and still you cannot find any dental related cause and you are suspecting trisaminal neuralgia or any other medical uh, pathosis, then you need to refer the patient for the medical assessment. In patients with unstable trisaminal neuralgia, dental treatment can exacerbate pain even if performed at other sites in the mouth. Treating the area affected by trisaminal neuralgia with a local anesthetic block can reduce the degree of exacerbation. So you can try to give the block in that area that would help little bit, uh, that would give little bit of relief to the patient. But uh, at the end of the day, you need to refer this patient to the GP. Psychological and psychiatric disorders. The psychological status of patient, it can affect dental treatment plans and outcomes. You need to determine their psychological status by taking thorough medical and medication history. For example, if the patients are anxious and they are taking benzodiazepines or any other kind of drug that is making them drowsy and that is affecting their ability to think then you need to think about like is this patient um is this patient in his senses that he can give you the informed consent or not 
okay and noting the use of an indication for the psychoactive drugs patients with psychiatric and psychological disorders they may have barriers to adhering to dental treatment maintaining dental or uh, maintaining daily oral hygiene and attending regular dental reviews so you might have come across some patients like uh, which are mainly uh they do drugs or something they are they are not you know uh if that is the kind of patient so they would they they are not very regular with their dentist and they do not care or bothered to do the perform the daily oral hygiene or attend for regular dental reviews and they might be taking these drugs such as antidepressants antipsychotic psychostimulants and these drugs on the other hand would lead to dry mouth and for the dry mouth you know like it can the dry mouth would lead to caries in the teeth and the gum issues selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and serotonin and non adrenaline reuptake inhibitors antipsychotics and amphetamine they can also trigger the bruxism okay so in these patient it is very common to see dry mouth and bruxism psychotropic drugs are associated with many other adverse effects on oral and dental health consult the patient's medical practitioner if a psychotropic drug is suspected to be causing an oral adverse effect if you are suspecting that patient is taking this like any drug which is affecting their um uh, which is leading to the oral problems then you need to consult with their medical practitioner and patient with a history of sedative drugs such as analgesics anxiolytics illicit drugs or hazardous alcohol consumption they may have a tolerance to sedative because they are continuously taking that drug right so their body would get resistance to the low level of the medicine so you may need to alter the um, quantity if procedural anxiolysis or sedation is required for a patient tolerant to sedatives then you need to seek expert advice or refer for specialist management then substance use disorders and illicit drug use if the uh, illicit drug use can have adverse effects on oral health many illicit drugs would cause dry mouth and combined with a ketogenic diet like for example the uh, like the artificial food like which you can just buy from the grocery stores and a lack of oral hygiene because they do not really care if the patient is you know uh, they are using illicit drugs so they do not take care of their oral hygiene and there would be dry mouth and they would be eating very you know unhealthy diet so that would all lead to caries oral candidiasis and other oral infections intake of drugs through smoking increases the risk of oral cancer bruxism jaw clenching and result resultant tooth damage is common in users of amphetamines and cocaine if a substance use disorder is identified it is important to investigate the use of other substances you also need to identify if the patient is also taking any other uh, drug okay multiple drug use is common patients with a previous or current substance use disorder are at particular risk of developing benzodiazepine dependence consider the risk and benefits of using benzodiazepine for anxiolysis for a dental procedure so some patient if they are continuously taking this drug then um, uh, they, their body would get dependent on that and consider the risks and benefit if they they are very anxious and they are asking you that i'm very anxious about the dental appointment and i need to uh, take the benzodiazepine which is the anti anxiety drugs for the dental procedure then you need to uh, you know manipulate that 
drug dependent and drug seeking patients may present to a dental practice be circumspect if a patient demands analgesic drugs and exhibits a good level of knowledge or a preference for a specific opiate if the patient comes to you and he says that i am in pain and can you please write it for me like any form of opiate and then be more sure like if the patient is only asking you to prescribe a drug uh, which is a known cause of dependence be aware of legislative requirements for prescribing drugs of dependence to a drug dependent patient and advise the patient to consult their medical practitioner if you are suspecting that this is a drug seeking patient then you need to consult with their gp then respiratory uh, condition first of all is the asthma advise patients with asthma to bring their reliever inhaler and spacer to the dental appointments patients with severe asthma are at increased risk of adverse outcomes from sedation and general anesthesia so they they have the increased risk of uh, adverse outcomes from the sedation and the general anesthesia dental procedure requiring any sedation and general anesthesia should be undertaken in the um, hospital and with an anesthetist present okay so the these procedures you won't be doing anyways and the anesthetes uh, can cause bronchoconstriction in patients with anesthetes um exacerbated respiratory disease so it is better if you would prescribe them cyclox 2 selective anesthetic which is the salicoxib they do not cause any bronchospasm in patients with the anesthetic exacerbated respiratory disease if analgesia is required in asthmatic patient with non anesthetic exacerbated respiratory disease use a cox2 selective anesthetic or paracetamol so they, they just in a summary they just want to say that if the patient is in pain and he is asthmatic do not give them anesthetics only if you can try you can prescribe them cox2 selective anesthetic or the paracetamol patients with asthma can occur uh, can develop oral candidiasis secondary to the use of inhaled corticosteroids for the management of oral candidiasis we will refer to the page 114 and to prevent recurrence advise patients to rinse their mouth and throat with water and spit out after inhalation because these patients they are at increased risk of corticosteroids uh, sorry increased risk of candidiasis because these patients would be taking inhaled corticosteroids okay so what you can advise your patient is to rinse their mouth and throat with water and spit out after the inhalation so that would decrease the chances of oral candidiasis patients are sometimes prescribed a short course of systemic corticosteroids following an asthma exacerbation so consider delaying elective dental treatments until the course is complete so the elective dental procedures are regular scaling and clean if the patient like he has got any severe asthma attack um, like few days ago and he is now taking systemic corticosteroid which means that maybe through iv or through im or through other routes if he is taking corticosteroid then you can delay the elective treatment in that patient then copd dental treatments for patients with copd may need to be modified according to the patient's condition patients with severe copd do not tolerate being placed in horizontal position so it is very important you will not lie those patients in horizontal position patients with severe copd are at increased risk of adverse outcomes from sedation and general anesthesia so same as like asthma so the treatment should be taken and uh, done in the hospital with the anesthetist present and patients with copd are sometimes prescribed a short course of same like asthma if they are prescribed systemic corticosteroid delay the elective dental treatment patients with copd can develop oral candidiasis 
because they would also be using the inhaled corticosteroid you can advise the patient same thing like rinse their mouth and throat with water and spit out after inhalation in some patients with copd supplemental oxygen is contraindicated consult the patient's copd action plan okay so everything is similar between asthma and copd only thing is that you cannot lie these patients horizontally okay then obstructive sleep apnea uh, dentists have an important role in the multidisciplinary management of obstructive sleep apnea including the diagnosis of facial skeletal retrusion and the construction of mandibular advancement splint so you must know like the obstructive sleep apnea this is also very common problem these days and uh, you can uh, like play a role in diagnosing the obstructive sleep apnea by looking at the facial skeletal because there would be retrognathia of like these patients would have retrognathia so to help with the retrognathia there is a splint which is name uh, which name is uh, mandibular advancement splint so this is being made by the specialist and they would you know that would help in normal breathing and some patients with obstructive sleep apnea can be effectively treated with the mandibular advancement splint but this must be done in association with the multidisciplinary team so because you know what happened with this one is uh, you need to refer the patient for the sleep study so they what they will do is they would they would just um you know uh, they would do the sleep study in which they would observe the patient during the night time how well he is sleeping like the, do he is do he do the mouth breathing that obstructive sleep apnea means he is not getting enough oxygen while he is sleeping so that's the reason he needs to open his mouth to do the breathing that is affecting his jaw uh, jaw size okay so then they make this splint which is the mandibular advancement splint and this is also one scenario in exam where they will give you the scenario about obstructive sleep apnea and they would ask you which is the best splint. So mandibular advancement splint. The use of oral appliances for management of obstructive sleep apnea are reviewed in detail in the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. Okay, snoring may or may not be a sign of obstructive sleep apnea. It is not possible to diagnose the cause of snoring without a medical examination because sometimes there might be any tonsils or any other problem that is a cause of snoring and sleep laboratory investigation in which they would do the sleep study. Use of oral devices to treat snoring without such investigation is not appropriate. If obstructive sleep apnea is suspected, refer the patients for medical assessment. Just give me a second, guys. I'm sorry. Just a second. Okay. Thank you. So patients with obstructive sleep apnea are at increased risk of respiratory arrest from sedation and general anesthesia. So dental procedure requiring sedation and general anesthesia should be done in the hospital with the anesthetist present. So for every respiratory condition, the, uh, the treatment for sedation and GA should be done in the hospital. Then viral hepatitis, the most relevant hepatitis virus to dental practice are the blood-borne viruses that cause chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, which are the hepatitis B and C. Most cases of hepatitis C can now be cured with antiviral therapy. So there is a cure for hepatitis C, but there is no cure for hepatitis B. Patients with chronic or untreated hepatitis C have a higher incidence of oral lichen planus, dental caries, and periodontal disease. Periodontal health, in particularly 
uh, is marked markedly poor and salivary flow is reduced in patients with hepatitis C. So there is dry mouth, caries, periodontal issues, lichen planus, whether it is a direct viral effect or due to the cause, uh, due to other cause is unknown. Preventive dental care and management is particularly important for patients with hepatitis C because the outcome of major restorative treatment may be poor. So the prevention is the best policy. Like uh, you need to advise your patient to do the regular oral hygiene, come for the regular dental visit so that we can prevent the these conditions to happen, which are the caries or the gum issues. Before proceeding with an invasive dental procedure in a patient with chronic viral hepatitis, you need to consider the potential coagulopathy and immune compromise associated with end-stage liver disease. Consult the patient's treating specialist or multidisciplinary team to determine an appropriate treatment plan, including antibiotic prophylaxis. So, you, whenever you are going to treat any patient with the viral hepatitis, you need to consider the patient's treating specialist or the multidisciplinary team because uh, you may need to give the antibiotic prophylaxis for them. Avoid sedatives and NSAIDs in patients with viral hepatitis because they can cause liver toxicity. Paracetamol can be given but only at the normal therapeutic doses because if you, uh, if the patient takes no sub supra therapeutic doses of the paracetamol, that would also lead to liver toxicity. However, it is particularly important to ensure that the maximum dose of paracetamol is not exceeded because the patients with viral hepatitis are at increased risk of liver damage at supratherapeutic doses. So the paracetamol is safe, but only at the normal doses. Okay, and you may need to consider giving them the antibiotic prophylaxis. So consult their treating specialist or the multidisciplinary team to determine that. Okay, so we are done with the, this very important topic here and tomorrow hopefully we will do the antibiotic prophylaxis. All right, thank you so much guys for watching my video and I really hope to see you guys again in my next video. Thank you so much.